Hi, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everyone who's joined in and uh, from wherever you are joining. Thank you for joining in a bit early. I am Nikita from Upgrads Alumni Team. Can we get a quick check on where are you people joining from? Can you <clears throat> type in the chat box? Where are you from? Oh, okay. Mumbai, Canada. Nice. Lucknow. Oh, USA. Yeah. Good. Okay. We are really excited uh, for this webinar today. Um, and I hope you are as excited as I am. We have Nelson with us all the way from USA. Um, so um, if any of your friends are looking to uh, attend this webinar, please feel free to join, uh, share the joining link with them. Uh, we have about two minutes before we get started. So I'm just going to quickly run through the journey of Upgrad Rise, which is an initiative uh, for exclusively for Upgrad alumni. So we essentially run two tracks in this. One is the academic learning and one is holistic learning. In academic learning, we, um, we organize sessions uh, which are very domain specific. Um, so like a product management learner will get a workshop related to product management versus a data science person will get uh, something related to data science. While in holistic learning, uh, we, we focus on uh, soft skills, um, like we're doing a memory uh, enhancement session today. Um, then we've done design thinking, we've done uh, effective business communication. So all in all, in the last 1.5 years, we have completed about 350 live sessions uh, with 125 experts from around the world. And we have been able to manage, uh, engage 65% uh, of the alumni attend these RISE sessions, which equal to 37 million upskilling hours. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for showing interest in this uh, initiative that we are running for our alumni. Here's what we have in store for you today. We have Nelson, as I said, who is five times USA memory champion. He's been featured on Netflix documentary uh, called Memory Games. Fox's Superhumans and a few other um, documentaries on Nat Geo and other channels. He's also the author of the best-selling book of uh, Remember It. Uh, he's, I'm sure he's going to speak about it in a while with you. Um, and uh, he's also uh, the winner of Elite Grandmaster of Memory in USA. So today we are going to talk about the simple brain hacks to improve memory recall. This is, uh, this is we had done something similar, but very small, uh, I think sometime last year um, with Saloni Suri. Um, and this is an extended version of it. Um, and yeah, we have Nelson with us. So I quickly also wanted to talk about what we have in store for you next week. We are doing, we've picked up a few of the best, uh, or as I, uh, if I can say, uh, well, very well received sessions or workshops. Uh, we are doing a rerun uh, while we come to the end of 2021. So what you're seeing on my screen are the sessions that we have uh, sort of planned for the next week. I'm going to post the registration link in the chat box very soon. And uh, yeah, you can register for it. You can bring your buddies along uh, for these workshops. We'll be more than happy to have them. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll also be sending out a detailed email 
uh, about these sessions tonight. Please keep an eye out for it. Um, yeah, so with this, I hand it over to uh, Nelson to start the session. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Nikita. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Yes. Um, one moment. Can you see that okay? Yes, it's okay. Great. Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to everyone watching and, and thank you for allowing me to, to be a part of this platform. My name is Nelson Dellis. Um, I am a five-time USA memory champion. Um, I've been training my memory for the last 10 plus years. You know, I wasn't born with this gift uh, or, or skill. Uh, some people call it a gift. It's not a gift. Uh, it, it's definitely a skill. Memory and memory techniques and, and brain hacks and, and learning strategies are learnable um, for all of us. It's, it's something that we're not really ever taught. Unfortunately, we're kind of thrown into school and we're expected to start remembering things from the start, but nobody's ever really given us a little booklet or manual on how to use our memory uh, from the start. That's unfortunate because we have a lot of um, capabilities that we're not aware of. And hopefully at the end of this presentation, I'll have opened the door, I hope at least a little bit, uh, if not wide open uh, to help you guys kind of access um, what is latent within all of us, these memory skills. So uh, just a quick little note here, I believe you're allowed to leave some Q&A questions. Um, in, in your, your, your computer, you can find the little um, button on Zoom. Um, feel free at any point, if you have a question or something comes to mind about what I say in a comment, um, put it in the Q&A. And when I'm finished, um, I'm gonna take a little break, a few minutes to look at the questions you've asked and we can maybe go through some of the ones that make sense, um, time permitting. All right, so let's get started. So I always like to start my sessions with a little bit of a baseline test just to see for yourself as you watch this, you know, how good is my memory, right? So I'm going to give you guys maybe a minute or so to study this list. Please don't write it down. Just look at the list that you see on screen and do your best to memorize the 14 words that are here. They're completely random. Um, so I'll, I'll be quiet and let you guys focus on that for a moment. All right, maybe 15 more seconds or so. Three, two, one. All right, now take a moment, just close your eyes and just kind of see as quick as possible what you still have in your mind. What do you remember? Kind of keep track of that. Um, just make it aware be aware of, of, of how good or average or poor your memory was for this kind of list. And don't be afraid to be honest with yourself. It's okay. Most people, when they look at a list like this with no techniques can hold seven items plus or minus two. That's kind of the, the psychology literature accepted uh, value for what's uh, capable for most memories without any um, uh, additional strategies. All right, we'll come back to that list. In the meantime, as you kind of think about it, let me just give you a little more background about who I am. I think it's very important just because whenever I do a presentation, whenever I introduce myself, I think it's natural for most people to be like, well, this guy must be, he must have had something growing up. He must have had some ability to remember better. And I really want to kind of show my background and, and kind of talk about my journey because it really wasn't that way. And I, I don't exaggerate that because you know, if, if we're going to be completely honest, I did well in school. I got B's and and in certain times when I applied myself, I got A's um, and I studied physics and math. So I was good with numbers. Maybe if I had to be better at something memory wise, it might've been numbers, but it's not like I could have memorized, you know, hundreds of digits just because of that fact, you know, memory was always something that kind of was 
eh, I, I'd forget names, I'd forget numbers, nothing that a memory champion would uh, would, would would typically brag about. All right. Um, so the, why did I get into this world? How did this kind of turn for me? And it started all with my grandmother, who uh, in the mid 2000s uh, of the early 2000s, sorry, she uh, started suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And my grandmother lived abroad. Um, we grew up in France, and I live in the United States. She lived there near Paris, and we'd only get to visit her maybe once, maybe twice a year. So when she started developing symptoms of Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, it was every time more and more apparent that her mind was deteriorating. And it was more and more jarring for me to see that. Um, and I guess that's what affected me ultimately when she passed away, just watching her kind of lose who she was and, and kind of this thing we all have, which is a memory, right? I, I feel like a memory or memory in general is, is what makes us human. And so without that, what are we? Who are we? Right. It's it's kind of a very deep, difficult question. And, and then the first kind of thing that popped into my mind is, is could that happen to me? Is that is that my future? Is this a genetic thing? Is this is what gonna happen? Is this what happens to people in the Dallas family? And I didn't like that. I, I you know, I've always cherished my memories and I did not want to lose them in the same way. So I try to figure out what could I be doing? What uh, are there techniques? Are there things I should be eating? ways I should be living my life to help strengthen my brain. And one of the first things I discovered was this curious memory championship that existed. Um, it's been around for 25 years at this point in the US. And there's world championships. There's even an Indian memory championship, Chinese, UK, all over the world now. And while they may not be the most popular things uh, or most well-known competitions, they're growing. And um, I kind of fell in love with what was happening at these championships. And it was really fascinating to see what people were doing. And I think what really attracted me to compete was finding out that people in these competitions weren't gifted. It's not like these were, a, it was a collection of savants and people who had photographic memories. No, it was all people who had kind of a similar story. They learned about memory techniques, these ancient techniques I didn't know anything about and practiced just like any other skill. You want to learn the piano, you practice, right? You want to get faster at, at running marathons, you practice, you run every day, right? And it was the same thing with memory. And that I'd never heard of that. I had always thought memory was something you either had good, well, you know, versus bad, and you just accept it, right? So I, I dove into this, this championship and the techniques that came along with it, and started learning about them and was super inspired to train. And most of all, once I started training and seeing kind of the, the massive bumps up in my memory performance that it was giving me i was i was hooked it felt like i had unlocked some kind of superhuman power um not even exaggerating i mean it, it uh, i couldn't memorize a few cards and then at some point by training i was able to memorize an entire deck of cards and fast under five minutes at, at the very beginning so that just got me hooked and eventually i started competing and competing and uh won um 2011, 2012, 14, and 15. And most recently this year, I actually won my fifth title. I've been trying to win the fifth title. So I actually haven't updated the slide for that yet. But um, also some records that I've broken along the way, memorizing the, a deck of cards, uh, the fastest 40 seconds, the most numbers, 325 uh, digits, and then the most names. Um, actually, this is uh, should be updated as well. It's 235 names in 15 minutes. And, and I, I like to brag about the, 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 those numbers, but more, it's it's it's. I hope to 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 seem like a statement of, well, at some point Nelson couldn't do that, and and that's true. I couldn't memorize a deck of cards, let alone forty seconds. I couldn't even do it in in twenty minutes. Um, and uh, the most digits, I couldn't memorize, you know, a phone number. And and here I am doing a three hundred and twenty five digit number. You know, so I hope that kind of gives you some perspective on on where these techniques can take you. And on top of that, what's very interesting is to see the progression of the sport. I was pretty good at the time. I am not good comparatively uh, now, um, believe it or not. So people who can memorize cards at the top are memorizing them now in 12, 13 seconds. And you know that's with any sport where people train and, and develop techniques, it's constantly improving, which always makes me so amazed. You know, like what's the limit of the mind? And you think, well, maybe, I don't think they can do under 10 seconds, but Sure enough, I bet you in, in five to 10 years, there'll be people memorizing cards in under 10 seconds. Mind blowing. And to give you an idea what these competitions look like, 
this is kind of a looks kind of like somebody's taking a test you know you basically are studying information and then recalling it not the most exciting i must admit to watch but uh um when you understand what they're what we mental athletes are doing in our minds it is quite fascinating so um kind of along this journey i i realized that you know i I need to share this with people. A lot of people I'd tell about the championship or memory techniques, they'd look at me and scratch their heads. They'd never heard of that. Um, and so kind of my mission became, okay, how can I teach people about this? And in the process, hopefully raise their awareness for Alzheimer's disease and brain health in general. And so I started a charity called Climb for Memory, which combines my passion for memory, but also for climbing. I'm a big climber. Um, I love to, to, to go to high altitudes, push the body. Um, climbing is also very mental, surprisingly. So it all kind of tied together. And um, I've done a few fundraisers, climbing Everest, um, to raise awareness and get people to turn their heads and kind of learn about brain health. Because what I find is pe when people talk about health, you know, in general and longevity, they think of what you eat for your body or, or, or physical training for your body. You know, it's always about the health of your heart, your lungs, which is great, of course, but nobody really thinks about training or eating right or adjusting their lifestyle for their mind, right? Um, and that's kind of what I wanted to try to change, that there are things that we can do to help improve the longevity of our brain health. And here, just because I love to share these, um, uh, the mountaineering aspect of, of my, my career as well. I've, I started small and, and started training as well to, to kind of get to higher and higher peaks. This is a large peak in North America. There's Everest from the north side and Kilimanjaro. These are all peaks that I've, I've been to. I haven't summited Everest yet, but I've been very, very close. Right near on the left there, you can see the, the top. I just was uh, 50 meters below there. I had to turn around, but um, that's another entire presentation. <laughs> so, all right. So today we're going to talk about memory techniques, of course, but I also want to broaden it a little bit and give you guys some brain essentials, the four brain essentials that I try to incorporate in my daily life to keep my brain healthy, right? And it's, it's four things, exercising your mind or using your memory or, or some kind of mental um, uh, exercise throughout your day, eating well, eating the right foods to help your brain, exercising your body. So physical fitness plays a part and then being social. All right. So we'll touch on these a little bit. Obviously my expertise is exercising your mind, the techniques. So we'll focus largely on that. Now, so let's get into that. The first thing I'm going to do is a little exercise and I want you guys to close your eyes and I'm basically going to paint a picture for you. And I just want you to close your eyes and visualize what I'm kind of explaining as best as you can. Okay. So relax, close your eyes, no stress. And what I want you to start by visualizing is it's a blue, sunny day. The sky is blue, uh, no clouds, it's perfect temperature. And maybe imagine you're in the middle of a field and it's so green, it's perfect field, it's clean, freshly mowed grass. Um, and it's just you right there in the field, perfect. All right? When suddenly, all of a sudden, right next to you, poof, out of thin air, pops up Albert Einstein. Okay, he's right next to you. And you notice that he's doing circles around you. He's skateboarding, it seems. But under his feet, it's not a skateboard, it's an acoustic guitar. All right, very strange, I know. But imagine this Albert Einstein is kind of skateboarding around you while standing on top of this guitar. It's just kind of like hovering above the grass. It's not a real skateboard, it's a guitar. Very strange. All right, a little further out from you, um, poof, out of thin air as well, you suddenly see um, this monster, this Frankenstein monster, right? So you can picture, you know, this kind of tall beast looking thing with his arms outstretched. He's painted green. He's got bolts coming out of his neck, right? He's moaning. He's kind of spooky. And he's, he's kind of going back and forth. And you notice that as you stare at his, his feet, he's kicking around something. And you notice that it's a, a live rocket, or missile looking thing and it kind of takes you aback. You're unsure if it's gonna explode or take off or whatever, why is he kicking it? But you see this Frankenstein monster kicking a missile. All right, even further down in the distance of this field, the next thing I want you guys to um, picture is a kangaroo who's just bouncing around back and forth. And you notice in his little kangaroo hands, he's holding a clump of blonde hair. 
and he's screaming at it. Okay, a very high pitched, kind of shrill, almost human like scream, just screaming at this wig, this clump of hair. Okay, this kangaroo is screaming at a wig. And then finally, I know these are all absolutely bizarre, but just stay with me here. Um, in the very far end of the field, at the very end, uh, one last image. I want you to imagine Chewbacca from Star Wars. If you don't know who that is, just imagine some big, hairy monster thing, like a Yeti, right? And uh, he's dribbling, like playing basketball, with an entire refrigerator. Okay, this massive object, he's able to bounce it off the floor, he shoots it into a hoop, all sorts of crazy stuff. It's not even possible, but our minds can stretch and visualize things that are a bit over the top and fantastic, right? So we have this uh, Yeti Chewbacca guy uh, dribbling, playing basketball with a fridge. Okay, so you can open your eyes and let's just recap what we saw, right? We had Albert Einstein skateboarding on the guitar. We had the Frankenstein monster kicking a missile, right? We then had a kangaroo screaming at a wig or clump of hair. And then we had Chewbacca dribbling a fridge or playing basketball with a fridge, okay? Now, what on earth was that, okay? Um, very maybe fun to visualize, but it actually represents in my world, in my world of memorizing numbers, this uh, set of digits, right? And, and of course, you're gonna be scratching your heads like how or why, um, but that's not really important right now. We can talk about this later, but what I wanna get across is, let's say I gave you this to visualize instead of that little story. This is harder. Like we look at this and we see a, a, a large series of symbols, right? That really don't have much meaning. Maybe, you know, you look at these numbers and you see your birthday and they're fine. Uh, or maybe you see, you know, your favorite number, um, but it's, that makes it somewhat easier in certain parts, but so many digits in a row, it's, it's, it's not easy for our brains to just scoop this up. Whereas the story I told you is easy for our brains to just scoop up. It's what it does. All right. And this kind of leads me to the first point about memory, which is things are easy to remember when we add meaning. And, and meaning is a very subjective term, right? It can be when, when you're visualizing Albert Einstein or Chewbacca or whatever, you're pulling on your life experiences and your knowledge about those things, if you have any, uh, to create that image. So Albert Einstein, most people know who that is. Um, you know, maybe you kind of know who he is, maybe you don't know what he looks like, so it's hard to visualize. So maybe you just picture the generic older scientist guy in a, in a white lab coat with crazy white old man hair, right? Um, but maybe you do know what Albert Einstein looks like. You can visualize him in a documentary you saw recently, right? So that might come to mind. So we all have our experiences and, and that meaning that you pull is, is what makes those images stick a lot easier. Whereas with the numbers, we don't really have access to such uh, associations so easily. And like I said, you might find some meaning here and there if you see your phone number or part of it or your favorite number, but that's difficult for a lot of numbers. So our goal, whenever we memorize, is to turn the difficult things into uh, this easy, easier uh, content with meaning, okay? And now why, why is that hard? Why is something like this difficult? right? Versus me telling you these bizarre images. Well, the, the belief behind it is that our brains are necessarily not necessarily designed for the modern world, right? If you think about numbers, language, philosophy, um, all these kind of concepts, abstract concepts are relatively new in the history of the human brain, right? And it's, it's evolution. So you think of what our brains needed in the past to survive in very simple times, you know, it was just visual, right? Here is a safe place to be. I remember what this looks like. This is my, my cave or my, my, my home versus this area over there is where all the lions are, right? It's gonna, they're going to eat me. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you get the idea. Or this plant pattern is edible. I could eat it and be alive. Or this one is poisonous, right? Uh, that's a visual thing. There were no numbers. There were no fancy uh, philosophy ideas, right? Um, this is all relatively new. Um, so our brains were not designed for that. Can they memorize it? Sure, but it's it's not as easy as, as my point. So we need to trick the brain, right? We need to make the complicated stuff seem like it's the easy stuff that it was designed for, all right? We need to give it that meaning. So step number one is that, and, and I call this visualization, 
all right, is turning what you're memorizing into a picture, a mental picture. Now, visualization is kind of a misnomer in a way because it sounds like, you know, you have the word visual in there. You think about like, okay, let me see it in my mind. But obviously you can't see something in your mind. You're not really using your eyeballs in your, in your, in your third eye, if you, call, if, you, if you will. It's really constructing an image using all of your senses to make it as real as you can without obviously having it be real. So if you take the example of imagining or visualizing pizza, okay, Yes, you can kind of see um, a circle, you know, pie with cheese and tomato on it, but that's that's dry and, and not really using all that our, our our minds can can do when we visualize. So, when you're trying to visualize something, you want to try to use sight, smell, taste, touch, sound, right? All the senses to make that image as visual as possible. So instead of just visualizing or seeing the the, the pizza. Imagine what it would be like if you picked up a slice and ate it. Is it delicious? Is it the best pizza you ever had? Is it kind of rotten? It's been left out for weeks now and it's moldy. You know, it's disgusting. Maybe the the the, the tomato sauce isn't tomato sauce. Maybe it's blood, right? It's just it, the more over the top you can make this, the more memorable it is, right? What would the actual texture of the pizza feel like? Maybe you have a piece of or a, a dripping of, of grease coming down your your wrist as you hold the slice, right? Uh, the, the color, right? The, the sound of the, 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 the cheese popping and crackling, maybe it's fresh out of the oven. All those things will help make this image pop. On top of that, you wanna add emotion. You know, so I, I, I said maybe the, the, the sauce is blood, right? Kind of gives you a reaction, right? Like what happened? Why is that so violent, right? Um, or, or kind of horrifying, right? Those are the types of things that actually stick better. So if you can instill some kind of humor, bizarreness, grotesqueness, even erotic things, those are the things that our brains just naturally, emotionally uh, tie ourselves to. So you can boost your images with those um, emotions uh, added. And then one final thing is, is action. So you have using all your senses, uh, emotions and then action. So anything that can make your image move, whether it's you know just simple moving from left to right or, or bouncing or hitting something, that for whatever reason helps uh, boost your your memory for a thing even more. So if you do this first step, visualization, can you still forget? And the answer is yeah, okay, but you you have to eliminate what most people do when they say I forgot something is I have a bad memory. My memory just is horrible. Nobody can say that anymore because we don't have bad memories. Okay. The only two things that happen here, once you know these techniques is a, if you forget something, you don't, you didn't pay attention. That's a whole other presentation in itself. Um, but you know, we have to pay attention to something, focus on it to be kind of received by our, our mind to process and memorize, or you didn't make your pictures memorable enough. You didn't visualize well enough and that's okay. You can, fix that, right? So maybe something didn't stick because you were trying to imagine what it sounded like and felt like, okay, maybe that wasn't enough. Maybe you have to go back and say, okay, how did it make you feel? What was the emotion behind it? What was the reasoning and the whole story and, and, and really add the detail to make it pop, okay? So this is encouraging because now you go forward knowing these techniques and you forgot something, no more of this, I have a bad memory. It's okay, I just got to go back and tweak my image so it's a little more memorable for me. Right? And we all have our different preferences. As you'll see when I do some more examples, I have a certain way of visualizing things. It's very, you know, sometimes it's quite violent or, or, or grotesque and very like a lot of things hitting things and, and breaking things. Um, but some people might prefer something a little more peaceful, a little more just funny. Um, and that, that's fine. It's just whatever works, you have to figure that out as you practice this. But yeah, everybody's a little bit different. So how's that first list doing? right? I've talked a whole lot, but uh, chances are you haven't had a real chance to think about it again. Um, take a moment to kind of see what pops back into your mind the soonest. Um, but I guarantee most people, if they didn't use any type of technique, you'll find that it's, it's a lot of it has gone. Um, and if I were to ask you this tomorrow or a week from now, probably a week from now, for sure, it would be entirely gone, except for maybe one or two items. And that's just what our brains do. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but our brains are naturally forgetting things. 
just kind of trying to drop information that isn't useful um, to kind of preserve space and attention for things that might be of importance right now. That's just what our brain does. So now there's two, two things that could happen. One is, you know, you've just forgotten things, just they're gone, right? But some things could be gone and I could show you that list again, or I could tell you a few of the words and you'd be like, oh yeah, I remember that, right? Which means it, it's somewhere still in there. It's just, you weren't able to retrieve it, right? So memory, you know, people just say I have a bad memory, but sometimes it's not necessarily the memory part. It's just the retrieval part. You'd have a problem getting the information out of the place where it exists in your mind, right? And if you're given a little cue or a little hint, it can come right out, right? It's just on that tip of the tongue, that tip of the tongue feeling where you can't quite get it yourself, right? Or it might come later when you don't need it, you know, you don't have control over how to get it out. So I show this picture because this is essentially what our brains are. Uh, you know, you learn a new fact, you imagine a little piece of paper, that's a new fact you're entering into your memory and you put it in this room and just drop the paper on the floor, right? The windows are open, everything's a mess, the wind could come in and shake things up. So when you go back in there to get that same piece of information, it might be on the top, like where you left it, or it might've been mixed up. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. The, the, the point I'm trying to get is that you haven't given the information some kind of structure, so it's easy to retrieve every time. So what if we could turn this mess into something like this, right? Something super neat, color-coded, uh, organized neatly, right? So if I want a specific piece of information, you know, I just find the, 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 the tab for it and pull it out, voila, there it is, and I put it back when I'm done. Sounds great, right? I mean, of course, why wouldn't I want to do this? But sounds kind of out there. How do you take your thoughts, you know, these racing thoughts and ideas in our monkey brain minds that, uh, and give it some order. It's not the easiest thing. I admit it's not an obvious thing, but thankfully the Greeks and, and ancient civilizations have been figuring out how to do this for, for much longer than we have. And, and a long, long time ago in many different civiliza civilizations. And they had to, right? Because they didn't have information uh, the ways of storing information like we do, computers, books, iPads, phones, right? It had to be up here or it was nowhere at all, right? Give me one second. Here we go. Sorry about that. So what are these strategies? Well, it starts by figuring out how to take the information and to organize it in a way that's easy to access. And, and a good way to, to kind of compare it is to think about, say, a computer, right? When you save a file, right, on your computer, you don't just press save and, and let it do its job. It asks you what's the name of the file, right, first of all, and what folder or what location on the computer's drive are you going to put it? Where is it going to be? Why? Because when you want to get it back, you better have a way to to, to target it and to pull it back out, right? You know, it's you've written a, a document, it's in this folder called documents, right? And you've named it, uh, you know, today's document, right? So, you know, that's the one I got to get, right? So in the same way, when we save on our mental computer, we're just pressing the button and that's it and hoping that we can get it back easily later. But what we really need to do is to be giving it a file name and to be putting it in a folder, a designated folder that we can get out, right? So how do we do this, right? There are different strategies, but the main one that I use and a lot of memory athletes use, and this is the one the Greeks used thousands of years ago, the Romans, um, other ancient civilizations, there's even been um, records of this uh, in, in one form or another, but basically it's called the journey method. That's what I call it. Um, all other names you may have heard of are the mind palace, a memory palace, a method of loci, it's all the same thing, essentially. And what it is, is you basically take a familiar place, could be your house, could be your gym that you go to, your walk or commute to work, your school, um, and you imagine a starting point and, and walking through the space to an ending point. And along the way, you make specific stops uh, at anchor points, okay? And what you do with these anchor points is you imagine or place the visuals, the visualization images from the stuff that you're memorizing along the way. 
Okay, so this is a very bizarre picture, but these could be the funny images that I have, the visuals for whatever list, let's say, that I'm memorizing, and I've placed it around this room on a certain path. And the idea is, is that that room or that space serves as the file cabinet to where you've stored your information. And when you want to retrieve it, all you have to do is say, ah, I stored it in my house. Let me walk back through my house. I know my house. I don't have to memorize that. And I know how to walk through my house. It's up here very easily uh, uh, rem remembered. And you just walk through it and, and remember the pieces that you placed along the way. Now, this sounds kind of like a very roundabout way like to do something where you could probably just, you know, do rote memorization. Why would you go out of your way to come up with a weird picture, to store it in a house, right? But it actually takes advantage of things that our brains are naturally good at. One, thinking in pictures, that's the visualization part. We remember pictures better than abstract information. And secondly, spatial information. We remember that so well. It's kind of hardwired into who we are as humans, I believe. So if we can kind of take advantage of those two things, you're basically setting your memory uh, on, on fire in a good way. So, you know, the, also the nice thing about memory palaces and journeys is they can be as long or as large as you want, right? So it, at some point, the question of, you know, how much could you memorize is coming down to, well, how many memory palaces do you have? And how much, uh, how many anchor points do you have? Because essentially an anchor point is a place to store data. So the more you have, the more tech terabytes or gigabytes uh, you could store. Um, you know, I, I'd like to memorize Pi. I've spent many, many hours studying it and memorizing many digits. And a lot of people ask me, well, how many can you do? And I say, well, as many as I want, given the, the, the memory palace uh, space that I design or create for it. And of obviously the time to, to sit down and learn it. But I never really get full because I can always just create another memory palace or I can extend the memory palace that I have, you know, and journeys or memory palaces can be as big or as small as you want them to be. You know, a memory palace could be a room. You know, if you have a small apartment, your memory palace could be that room and your pathway, your, your journey through the space, the anchor points you choose could be the door. You know, the little table by the door, the window, you know, you just make a little path and choose specific points along the way. Now you could even just take a house. If you have a house or you know a house, you know, each location could be an entire room. Depends how generous you want to be with using up the space. You know, I joke sometimes that you could teach someone, uh, let's say how to use, memorize all the US presidents, there's 46 of them, on a bar of soap. A bar of soap could be a memory palace. Uh, now, it's not the most interesting memory palace because it's just usually a white block of soap. But I guarantee if you look close at a piece, a bar of soap, there's going to be enough detail, you know, scuff here, uh, a corner, the center, maybe the logo, you know, maybe some bubbles, whatever. Um, there's enough little points that you could use as an anchor point to store information. And that's a miniature one. Imagine, you know, your whole bathroom, there's one little bar of soap. And then there's the shampoo bottle. All those things could be mini worlds that you could store information on. So let's try memorizing a list, okay? And we're gonna use a memory palace together, our first memory palace ever, all right? And like I said, a memory palace can be any place that takes up space. I said a house, school, whatever, that's fine. But you could also use your body, all right? This is a very classic first memory palace to try because everybody has their own body. Um, and all we have to do is basically decide where we start, maybe at the top of our head, and where we would end the memory palace or the journey down by our feet. Okay, it doesn't have to be this, but I'm just giving you an example. Now we have 10 things here. So we need 10 locations. So we'll start at our head and go down to our feet and we'll have 10 different anchor points along the way. Okay, so I'm going to explain what to visualize on, on all of our body parts, and you just kind of go along and, and try your best to think about it and see what I'm telling you. All right, so our first location in our journey is the top of our head. All right, you can visualize it on my head, you can imagine it on your own, it doesn't matter. Um, and we're going to picture this word rushing. Okay, and what I want you to visualize is maybe on top of your head are people who are rushing back and forth. Okay, They've, maybe it's like a crosswalk in a busy city. And 
there's people just rushing back and forth, right? They got somewhere to be, they got something to do. They're rushing back and forth. All right, next we make our way down our pathway here and maybe let's go to our ears, okay? And we're gonna put our second item on our list here. We're gonna visualize it and place it on this location or imagine it in this location. So we're gonna have this next word, which is leaf. And I would picture literally a leaf coming out of your ear. And maybe let's add a little more detail. Maybe it's you know, a, a, a rich fall colored leaf. It's red uh, or, or dark uh, orange. Um, and it's just kind of sprouting out of your ear. You, maybe it tickles the inside of your ear or you can hear it kind of crinkling as the, the wind blows at it, right? But it's kind of stuck in your ear, right? How annoying would that be, right? So you have this leaf in your ear. Next, we go to our, from our ears to our eye, our eye area here, and we have the word hamburger, all right? So let's imagine putting a hamburger right over our eye, pressing it in there, right? And maybe a, a tear of mayonnaise comes down our face, right? Um, and, and maybe it smells delicious. It was just grilled, right? You can smell it. Um, maybe you even want to take a bite of it, but it's kind of stuck to your eye socket there, okay? Next, we'll come down to uh, our nose, our nostrils, and we have chopsticks, all right? So let's imagine taking some chopsticks and just jamming them up our nostrils, all right? Not the most pleasant thought, probably would hurt, might, might even kill you <laughs> if you put it up, up far enough, but uh, you know, in our mind, we can exaggerate and, and make things lighthearted. Um, let's just imagine jamming those up there, how uncomfortable that would be, and hey, maybe you can even pick up sushi or, or, or rice and eat it. Uh, with your own chopsticks coming out of your nose, okay? Next, we go to the mouth, okay? Down from our nose to our mouth. And I want you to imagine trying to jam a soccer ball into your mouth. Impossible, yes. But in our mind, we can stretch it and, and go over the top. But let's imagine just being able to stretch open our jaw and jam in this soccer ball. How would that feel? How ridiculous would that look? All these kind of other things you can add to this visual. Next, from our mouth, we go down to our chin. And next, we're going to picture a kangaroo, okay, just bouncing on our chin, right? And maybe you can imagine a very, he's a tiny little kangaroo, the size of, you know, one of your fingers, right? And he's just like bouncing on your chin, just, it's just permanently there, right? And it's like the outback, Australian outback here on your chin is just, he's just living there, okay? Now, let's keep going. We're almost done here. After we're done with the chin, maybe let's go down to our armpits and we're going to imagine that there's some delicious, curry flavored sauce just kind of coming out of uh your armpits um it's delicious right ever this is disgusting i know but uh remember this is sometimes you have to go there because that is what will make things memorable right so you let your armpit curry maybe you take a bowl of rice and every lunchtime that's where you eat your food it's disgusting but it's delicious can't help yourself right next uh we'll go down to our belly button all right and we have the word pirate so maybe imagine in your little belly button, there's a little tiny pirate ship and there's a pirate aboard saying, arg, right? That's what pirates say, arg, all right? So you can hear that kind of bellowing in your belly button, echoing in there, it's strange. All right, two more, we go down to our knees, that's our next location. And we have this word kazam, kind of bizarre word, but it kind of sounds like a magic word. Like you wave your wand and kazam, something magic happens, all right? So imagine maybe, sticking out of your knees are some magic wands, right? And if you wiggle your knees a little bit or, or clack them together, kazam, that word happens, you hear it and something magical happens. Maybe a rabbit comes out of a hat or some confetti comes out of the sky. I don't know. Kazam. And then finally, the last image, we're down to our feet. We're at the end of our memory palace, our journey. Imagine your toes are just, you're just standing in a kind of pile or, or a puddle of algae. Okay, so some kind of green, slimy water, murky, warm, uh, feels kind of good, but weird at the same time, right? You're standing in algae, all right? So let's step back and see if we can remember that, right? And remember, this is how we go about it. We've stored the information in our memory palace on our body. And to retrieve it, all we have to do is start at the beginning of our memory palace and retrace our steps. So let's, I can't hear you guys, but try to do this along with me, all right? We'll go to our head. What was happening on our head? What was the word, right? There were people going back and forth. They were rushing, right? Then we went down to our ears. What was sticking out? A leaf, right? 
And then we went into our eye, what was pressed there, hamburger, right? Then we go down to our nostrils, what will we jam up there? Chopsticks, right? Then we go down to our mouth here, open it up. What do we jam inside? Soccer ball, right? What was bouncing here? Kangaroo, right? What happened when we lift our armpits? Curry was coming out, right? In our belly button, we had a pirate ship, right? And what was the sound the pirate was making? Arg, right? And then finally, on uh, the last two on our knees, we had that magic word, right? With the magic wands, Kazam. And then finally, our toes, we were standing in some slimy algae, all right? Now, it may not be that impressive when I kind of guide you through that, but if after this talk, you take a moment to close your eyes and see if you can remember them, I guarantee you they'll still be there. What's even more impressive is that you'll be able to say that list forwards and backwards, okay? And, and to do it backwards, all you do is start at your toes, make your way back up to your top of your head. I could also ask you, what's the fifth thing on our list? And you just say, okay, one, two, three, four. Oh, it was what was in my mouth, soccer ball, all right? Now, those were random words, but they actually represented some information. And in this case, uh, it was images to represent countries. And that list specifically was were the largest countries by land size, uh, by area. So rushing was Russia. Okay, sounds like Russia rushing. The leaf was Canada. I think of like a maple leaf, and the the, the their flag has a a, a a leaf on it. Hamburger. I think of, that's my association for the USA. You know, we're always grilling burgers, Fourth of July, all that stuff. Chopsticks. I think of China. Um, soccer ball, this is arguable, but Brazilians are very good at soccer, uh, most World Cups. So I, that's soccer ball is Brazil. Kangaroo, I think of Australia. Curry was my image for India. Uh, pirate, uh, you know, they say ARG. So that was my cue to remember Argentina. Not perfect, uh, but close enough. Sometimes I just need a little bit of a hint to help me get the rest of the word. I know Argentina, but to help me remember ARG. Okay, I can get the rest from that. The ARG uh, related to a pirate is what I needed. Similar with Kazam, you know, there's no other countries that start with K-A-Z other than Kazakhstan. So if I can think of a word like Kazam, uh, that can help me get that word. You know, you might also think of Borat, if you're familiar with Borat, he's from Kazakhstan, right? But again, what I'm trying to get at, there's no, there's no right or wrong image here. A lot of these are my personal associations. Uh, maybe for Russia, you think of a uh, vodka, right? Maybe on your head, you have a vodka bottle instead of rushing, right? Maybe instead of a leaf for Canada, you think of people playing hockey, right? So maybe there's a hockey player in your ear, right? And so on. And then algae sounds like Algeria, right? So some of these were just direct associations that I have for the countries personally. Some were more like what it kind of sounds like. If I can remember what it's, the word sounds like. I can get that back, but it doesn't matter. At some level, I found a visual. Uh, to represent the word, and I put it in my memory palace, and that's all I needed. Okay, so now you walk away with this uh, the, from this talk, at least with knowledge about the ten largest countries in the world, and, and I guarantee you this stuff will not disappear. You'll test yourself before you go to bed tonight. You'll remember it. Tomorrow you'll remember it. Probably a week, multiple weeks from now, you'll still remember this list. It just speaks to the power of of these these two steps: the visualization and the storage. This is our next task. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but here is an example of, of how far you could push this if you really wanted to. This is 10,000 digits of pi. Now the record for pi is, uh, I think, uh, held by someone from India for 70,000 digits, I believe. Um, but you know, if you have a way of turning these numbers into pictures, which I do, um, all you need is a memory palace to fit this all in. And uh, when I memorize this, I have a memory palace that uh, has 2,000 locations. Sounds crazy, but, you know, and you might think, well, I don't know 2,000 places, but what I did is I used my, my hometown, Miami, Florida, in the U.S., and each um, thousand digits is a neighborhood, you know, and I grew up here. I went to high school in another part of town. I went to college or university in another part. I worked for a few years in a different part. So I know many neighborhoods very well and putting them all together, I can make this massive memory palace. And I, I, I'm very familiar with all 2000 locations as wild as that sounds. 
And all I have to do is place a different image at each one to help me remember the five digit chunk uh, for each one. That's a whole other step, but the general idea is, is, is possible. Here's another example. This is uh, an overview of a, a garden um, museum here in Miami. And you know, for a TV show that I was on, um, I took the host around. We walked through it in physical, in, in real life. And we placed images along the pathway here, as you see, that represented the names of, um, of movies that were winners of the Oscars um, for the last 80 years or something. And we literally walked through the, the whole garden, imagining weird stuff. And at the end of it, he told me all 80 plus of those movies, forwards and backwards. And he, he was in shock. He was like, I'm never going to remember these, but let's try. And then he could remember them. So, um, you know, it's yes. You might need a little more work to do something like this, but you can literally be dropped into this technique, try it, and, and be able to memorize a list of 80, 100, 200, 500 things um, if you have the, the, the right structure of your memory palace. Now, the third step to memorizing is review, okay? So with steps number one and two, uh, visualization and storage, that gets the information in your mind very quickly, okay? But the question after that is, well, how long does it stay? And how do I keep it there for longer or not? You know, that's the thing. It depends. Sometimes we need things just for the moment, right? We're going to the grocery store. We have things we want to get done today, our to-do list. And then tomorrow we don't really care to use it again, right? So that wouldn't be something we need to keep forever, right? But on the other hand, if you're studying for a test, maybe you need the information until you take the test or at least uh, a few years after as well. Or maybe there's just stuff you want to know for the rest of your life, right? Maybe learning all the largest countries and their, and their capitals um, is something you just like to know as, as you know, knowledge in your mind forever, okay? These are different scenarios and, and re require different amounts of review. So in general, review is what makes the stuff that we put in our memory policies more permanent. The more you review, especially at the beginning, the, uh, the more, the quicker it gets into your long-term memory and then it's there for life, all right? So the science behind memory and forgetting um, starts, well, starts a while back, but um, this idea of forgetting, this forgetting curve came about in the late um, 1800s where a scientist was, a German scientist was basically realizing that, you know, let's say we memorize something, this is very unofficial graph. Um, but let's say on the left here, you know, is, is how much you remember of a certain thing, your retention. And once you, let's, let's be in a perfect environment, when you finish studying something or learning it, you have 100% retention, let's say, okay? How quickly would that disappear, right? And it turns out it looks something like this. And if you measure this um, in different people, in different scenarios, we all have a very similar forgetting curve. And again, this is what I was saying before, our brains were designed to forget at a certain rate. So you'll find that even within, you know, just a day or two, you've forgotten almost 75, 80% of what uh, you, you tried to memorize. That is if you haven't used any strategies or uh, done any review. And what the scientist uh, Ebbinghaus discovered is that, okay, as you forget, if, if, if at some point you review or you restudy what you, you studied, um, you know, you bring that back, that retention back up and you start to forget again, you kind of reset that clock, but the forgetting isn't as drastic. And if you repeat that process over and over again, you eventually keep most of it uh, close to hundred percent. And that's what we call knowing something in your, or having something in your long-term memory. It's there for life. And at some point you don't need to review it really anymore. It's just there, right? Think of a task, uh, a procedural task, that it's hard to do, right? At first, right? Something with your hands that like, I don't know, shuffling cards, right? If you've never shuffled cards before, you might be fumbling about, it's very difficult. You have to think really hard, but then maybe you learn some technique and you practice the overhand shuffle and you get good at it. And you, uh, uh, if you do it enough, at some point, you don't even think about it, right? It's in your long-term memory, right? That's essentially the same thing as your, you know, constantly practicing or reviewing something until it's built into kind of your muscle memory, we call it, is also your long-term memory. So before I jump into names, um, so that's kind of wrapping up the three steps to memorizing. It's, it's the visualization, the storage, and then review. 
Now, review doesn't sound very nice. It's kind of like, well, uh, I got to review. I got to spend time to, to put things into my long-term mem long memory. But with your first two steps, the memory palaces and the imagery, reviewing suddenly becomes a little easier and a little more enjoyable, all right? Because all it takes to review now is to go into your memory palace and just walk through it and just see what you see. That is essentially a, uh, a review session. So I can actually study something, you know, it's on a list of a piece of paper, let's say a list of things I'm trying to memorize. I can look at it once or twice, convert it into my pictures and put it in my memory palace. And then to, re to review, I don't even have to look at the paper. All I have to do is just think about my memory palace and then maybe later in the day, do the same thing and so on and so on until I just know it, right? So I can review while I'm driving. I can review while I'm in my bed, right? About to go to sleep. I don't have to be staring at a textbook or a piece of paper anymore. It's just all in my mind, which is super helpful and encouraging to help us review more, right? So let's talk about a, a specific use case here of, of how to remember names, right? So this is something that you can walk away with and it's, it's gonna help you tremendously in your business, in school, in relationships, whatever. We all wanna remember people's names. They're difficult, we forget them a lot, it's embarrassing, but it could also, you know, seal the deal in the business world, right? If you remember someone's name, it has a lot of value. So how do we apply these techniques, um, you know, visualization, storage, and review to remember someone's name live in the field? So I have some five steps, but, you know, it's essentially the three steps we just talked about, just with a few extra things to take note of. The first thing is to pay attention. Obviously, when you're meeting someone, you want to be in the mode of, or in the mindset of, hey, I wanna learn this person's name, right? You need to be ready to hear it. You need to be ready to ask for it. And if they tell you their name, you better be trying to process it, right? So make sure that you hear it. If you don't ask for it again, um, be in the moment uh, as best as you can when you learn someone's name. I find it helps when I tell myself before I meet someone, as I'm going in to shake their hand, I say to myself, what is this person's name? What is this person's name? And that's kind of like the only important thing to me at that point. I don't care what I'm going to say or, or trying to sound cool. I just want to know this person's name because that's the thing that is the most important thing to me right then and there. Second is you choose a feature. Now, what is this step? This is essentially your memory palace, right? Your anchor, right? Now, why aren't you putting a name inside of or this person's name inside of a memory palace like we just did for the countries? Well, because this is a little more difficult in the sense that we don't know who we're going to meet on a day-to-day -day basis and who we need to memorize the names for, or let's say we meet someone, maybe we'd never see them again, right? Why would we waste space in a memory palace um, when we don't know the context of this relationship, right? So instead, you make them the memory palace so that when they show up in your life, whether it's tomorrow, a week from now, years from now, um, they always have the anchor with them, right? And this will be on a feature, uh, typically on their face, it doesn't have to be, but it's a good place to start practicing is to, to pick, pick a feature on the person's face, right? And you do this in private, don't tell them, just kind of take a mental note of something you notice about their face. Could be complimentary, could be not so complimentary, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's for the purpose of memorizing a name, all right? So whatever you notice, whether it's a little dimple, right? Maybe it's a, um, a larger nose, uh, bushy eyebrows, a cool hairdo, whatever, all right? And once you have the feature, now you take the name, you know, at some point they're gonna tell you their name or you see the name and you're gonna turn it into a picture. This is step one, visualization. What does the name remind you of? What does it sound like? Uh, if it's a very complicated name, you can always break it down into smaller syllables and see what that eventually reminds you of. Right, and you come up with that image. We'll do some examples in a second. Once you have the image, you then intertwine the two. You, you attach the image to the location, just like we did on our body for the memory palace. But now you're doing it on their feature, right? So if they have a larger nose, you have an image for that name, you stick it on the nose or have it interact with the nose. It sounds bizarre, but again, this is what all these techniques are based on. Uh, kind of things that are over the top or stretching the imagination. And then finally, the review step, you know, once you put it on the person's feature, that usually will be quite powerful. But if you really want it to stay longer, 
you know, you have to do the review part. So one way to do that is to cement the moment and, and, and use the person's name immediately. Um, you know, ask them a question using their name or introduce them to someone else using their name. What I like to do is before I leave an event or a party or a situation where I'm seeing the person, I will, before I leave the room, mentally remember or, or, or review the names that I learned. And if I've forgotten one, if, if, if one just slips my mind, I will make sure to go back to the person and ask them. I go way out of my way to, to make sure that I have the person's names before I leave, because I think the most embarrassing thing in the world is to, uh, to, to, to not do that. And then, you know, you've missed your shot because asking for the name weeks later is too embarrassing. Now, a lot of you guys are raising your hands or asking questions. Don't worry, we're going to get to those. Um, let me just finish the presentation. I'm almost done here. And then we'll get to some questions. So let's just do a few examples here just so you understand what I'm doing. This is me, right? Nelson. All right. So first thing you're going to do, paying attention, hope. <laughs> Second is choosing a feature. All right. And uh, understandably, a photo is different than in live, right? Real life, right? In this photo, you have a lot more to choose from, right? Because nothing's changing. It's stuck, right? I might even choose my little vein here that's popping out on my, my forehead, right? But in, in real life, maybe you don't actually see that all the time, all right? So in general, you know, you can be a bit uh, flexible with what you choose. Um, you essentially want to try to choose something that um, won't change over time. That's the best, but that might be difficult at times. So let's just say, I mean, in real life, I'm really tall. So if you met me, you'd say, wow, he's tall. That might be your feature. Um, or, you know, I, typically I've been here, but I have a, and I've shaved recently, but I usually have a big red beard um, or my nose is kind of big. So let's choose my big nose. All right. Um, and then Nelson, what's the image for Nelson? Well, what comes to mind when you hear that word or see that word? Do you know someone named Nelson? Does it sound like something? Most people will say, ah, Nelson Mandela, right? Or Nelson is a character from the show, uh, The Simpsons. Um, Nelson, a half Nelson or full Nelson is like a wrestling move, supposedly. I don't know that too well. Um, or Lord Commander Nelson, historical uh, commander. Any of those are fine. And, and let's say you don't know any Nelsons, right? So maybe you say, okay, well, Nell, let me break it down. Nell kind of sounds like a nail, like a fingernail or like a nail that you hammer uh, into something. And then sun reminds me of the sun in the sky, right? So maybe my image, I've suddenly broken it down into a nail being driven into the sun with a hammer, right? That's my image, okay? All of these are acceptable. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna go with Nelson Mandela. It's a very memorable person. A lot of people know who that is and can instantly think of that. And then our next goal is to intertwine the two. All right, so I have my big nose and we have a picture of Nelson Mandela. So we can literally just imagine Nelson Mandela stuck to my nose, okay? As simple and as weird as that. You can elaborate too. You could maybe ask, well, why would he be there? Is it a miniature version of him? Like make it as weird as possible, right? But Nelson Mandela is now living on my nose. So next time you see me, you're gonna say, oh, there's Nelson with his big nose. Ah, N Nelson Mandela is on his nose. Ah, his name is Nelson. Hi, Nelson, right? You don't say all those steps out loud, but uh, you, you, you do those kind of steps in process in your mind. Here's another person. This is a random photo of, uh, I got online. Um, his name is Muhammad, all right? So what do I notice about him? Well, a few things, right? And, and don't feel bad about what you're choosing. It is what you, you see. Um, I might choose like his hair. It's kind of like spiky like that. So Muhammad, I think of like Muhammad Ali, boxer, right? So I'm going to imagine Muhammad Ali punching his hair so that it looks like that, right? He's kind of punching it into its shape. Um, and I like that action, right? Remember the hitting and the movement uh, helps kind of solidify um, images better sometimes. So there's someone like punching up his hair into that hairdo. And that's Muhammad. So I'm going to see him with his hairdo and think, oh, punching, hitting, boxing, Muhammad. Hey, Muhammad, right? All right, so let's wrap this up, uh, just kind of quickly touching on some of the other essentials that I mentioned outside of exercising your mind. Eating well, all right? So obviously you, what you eat matters. We all know this for our health, right? But it also matters for our brains. There are certain brain foods that uh, exist and that I take that help kind of keep your mind sharp 
I wouldn't say that they instantly improve your memory like the techniques do, but over time, there's definitely a lot of, of research that shows that some of these foods can put you in a better spot when you're older in terms of making your mind sharper, less foggy, all that jazz. All right. So um, some of those brain foods, the number one brain food um, is DHA omega-3. It's a fatty acid found naturally in the brain. Um, you can get that from eating fatty fish. There's also tons and tons of supplements that now include it. There's even foods that they put the supplement in um, to, to, to make it easier to consume. I don't eat a ton of fish. So for me, I take like a little um, supplement pill every day uh, with DHA omega-3. Also foods that are rich in vitamin E and lutein. So this is like dark leafy greens, eggs, um, and then foods that are high in antioxidants. So what the research shows as well is that inflammation um, is just a killer for, for the mind. Um, so anything that is an antioxidant that can reduce inflammation um, and eating, uh, eating less of the foods that cause inflammation as well um, will help keep your mind sharper. Being social, why is this important? Well, on, in, on two levels. One, in terms of the Alzheimer's components, you know, as you get older, if you're going to get Alzheimer's and you have a rich social network, at least you have people that can help take care of you, right? Uh, you have a, a strong care support network. Um, on top of that, though, it also encourages you to, you know, get out of your comfort zone, have conversations that are mentally challenging and stimulating. This is kind of tying back to exercising your mind. It keeps your mind um, active. You know, there's there's many many accounts of people who develop Alzheimer's at a rapid pace um, because. Uh, more rapid than normal because they're not interacting with people or they're alone, sadly, or, or they don't have much interaction. And that's just because they're not mentally challenged as much, right? They don't have as, as much stimulus going on around them to kind of keep their brain working. And then finally, exercise. Physical exercise actually improves your memory and your, your cognition, your sharpness. First of all, it makes you feel good. So it's kind of, a, you know, when you feel good about your body, you feel good about you just feel confident and everything kind of flows smoother when you feel good about everything like that. So that also Im Im, uh, impacts the mind as well. And memory is, is such a thing to, to it, it, it largely depends on confidence. You know, most of us are kind of insecure about our memories and that just helps defeat our memories sometimes. So when you start to use these techniques, these memory techniques, and you say like, wow, my memory is actually better than I thought and you do more of it, you start to build this confidence in your memory, which only just feeds the power of your memory more. And if you feel good about yourself and your memory, that even adds to it even more. Um, also, you know, there's research that shows that it increases the size of your hippocampus, which is um, the part of your brain that uh, is largely responsible for uh, your working memory and, and, and short-term memory. Uh, it also improves circulation and blood flow to the brain. And, you know, your brain is a highly vascular organ. So blood is constantly being needed up there. So the better that can be uh, distributed, the, 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 the sharper it can, it can be working, right? So ultimately, you have the power. I hope this, this kind of gives you some introduction to the potential of your mind. Um, I encourage you guys to challenge your mind. It's easy to just put something on your phone or, or just type it. Um, but try to use a memory palace, come up with a few memory palaces that you want to use um, and, and start memorizing things uh, proactively. Eat better, try new healthier foods, do some research, try to find what is good for your brain and try to incorporate some of it into your diet. Um, involve yourself socially and stay active, you know, move. I'm not asking you to, to go lift weights and, and, and be the next uh, uh, Olympian, but uh, just moving and being active as often as you can is, is really good for the longevity of your brain health. And simple, take care of your mind, respect it, value it. And um, uh, hopefully you guys can all benefit and live a, a long, healthy uh, life for your brain. Finally, thank you. Uh, this is my contact information. This information should be available uh, for anybody out there. And there's a Netflix documentary. I'm not sure if it's still available or if it's available in India, but um, at some point it'll, I'll, I'll, if you search for my um, uh, information, you might find this, this film. It's all about memory athletes and memory competitions. And then finally, um, I have a couple books that are available on Amazon. You should be able to find them. Um, one is called Remember It. Uh, this one is for uh, adult crowd. And then I have one for children as well. This is for, it's for many ages, but 
targeted 10 to 14 year olds um, to help them remember things for school. So, all right, let's um, go to the questions here. We're gonna take a, a couple uh, Q and A questions here. And, and if you have a question, take a moment to, uh, uh, to, to enter it in if you want something that I said. So someone asks here, um, might've missed this, but how to convert numbers to images, right? So at the very beginning, I talked about how, you know, that whole scene that I painted for you was this long number. I didn't really go into how that worked. That wasn't the point of that, but there are, this is the thing when you memorize things, right? That first step visualization, there is, you have to figure out how to encode or come up with a picture. All right. So when you're list, memorizing a list of words, let's say, nouns, very simple, right? Elephant, banana, shoe. These are things that instantly you can think of and visualize, right? Now, if you get a little more abstract, like, you know, liberty or extemporaneous, right? Difficult, abstract words. It's a lot harder to think of something, right? So you might have to think of something that it sounds like, or that it kind of reminds you of like liberty. I might think of the Statue of Liberty, right? It's a very iconic figure. It, it isn't liberty, but it represents liberty, right? And I, if I remember that, I can always remember liberty. Um, but if you take that even further to the extreme, a number, right? How do you remember a bunch of symbols that represent values, right? So there's strategies that memory athletes have come up with to translate numbers into letters. And those letters create words, and then we're back to uh, visualizing words. So I'm not going to go into it here, but if you're interested, just Google number memory systems. Um, kind of the top one that people use is called the major system, which basically ascribes a, uh, uh, um, a consonant sound to each of the nine digits, 10 digits, sorry, zero through nine. And you basically construct words um, and then you memorize the words and you can deconstruct the words into the numbers once you know the system. It's pretty easy to learn. You can learn it in five minutes. Um, and then practice makes perfect. All right, let's see what else here. There's someone asking about numbers here. Someone asking about numbers. So someone asks here, I usually forget my spectacles after overnight sleep. How can I um, uh, remember this? So I'm assuming you're forgetting your glasses where you place them or something like that. So here's a great little trick uh, when you're putting your wallet down or your car keys or your glasses or your remote, whatever, um, you know, first you have to recognize, okay, I, I maybe a remote's not a good idea because usually it's by the TV. Okay. But maybe your glasses. Yeah. That could be something you're always moving around the house You place them in different parts and overnight. Maybe you forget, right? So with items that you know, that are often misplaced, what I would recommend is before placing it down. Okay. You can do some kind of, you could do this orally or physically, some kind of out of the norm action, right? And I know this sounds ridiculous, but it really works. So before you place the, 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 the glasses down, maybe say something out loud that you would never say, right? Uh, something bizarre. Not like I'm putting my glasses down, but I don't know. Say something in a funny voice. Uh, just say a random word, right? Shock yourself, right? Uh, or you can do something physical. You could pinch your cheek or spin around or something bizarre. It doesn't have to be that crazy. But the point is, is if you make that moment stand out a little bit more than just by casually placing down your glasses, then when you it comes time to remember where you placed your glasses, you're going to remember, oh, it was right by the window where I would, you know, hit myself in the face or something like that, you know? Um, so doing some kind of action or saying something in the moment of, of, where when you you do that action or place that item will help you remember it. Now, will you forget to do that? Potentially, right? But this is the whole thing is, is yes, these are all techniques that work, but I hope more than anything, what it gives all of you is a new perspective on what information means coming through your mind on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I'd say the number one thing that I've learned from all this memory training is to be more present and to be always mindful of my memory, right? 
I used to not think about that at all. So I'd forget more, but now I always think whatever I'm doing, I see it through this lens of, am I going to forget this? How can I maybe make this moment a little more interesting to remember better? Right? So yes, there's the chance that I forget to do that in the moment, but now because I train this a lot and because I think about it a lot, those instances happen less and less. Um, let's see, let's scroll down here. Is memory connected to your mood? For someone with mood swings, could it be difficult? Please answer this. Yes, I actually, uh, and also, you know, if, if you want more content uh, about memory, I have a YouTube channel that has a ton of extra videos that explains a lot of the things more in depth. And I actually did a video about mood um, this past summer and some steps to, to, to kind of help boost that. And I think that memory is largely associated with, with how you feel right? Or it's definitely affected, right? If you feel down, not that confident, I, I mentioned this before, um, you, it affects your memory, right? But if you feel a little, if you feel confident, and, and, and everything's going well, um, you know, everything in your life tends to kind of roll along with that, and that can include memory. Um, so I see memory techniques as kind of an opportunity to hack that, right? Because you suddenly have a little trick or, or some strategies that help you um, uh, remember better, which I think will make you feel better when you don't forget stuff, uh, which could potentially affect your mood. And with mood, you know, it's it's hard to always pinpoint what's the thing that's making me sad or 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 down, right, or happy. But it could be the tiniest thing. And maybe one instance of remembering something better could make that difference, right? Maybe not all the time, but maybe a little bit of the time and here and there. So. That's my answer for that. Um, yeah, let's maybe do one more question here. Okay, here, how to increase the attention span in our kids? As parents, we are really struggling to handle our kids with this problem. That's a great point. Um, I think the number one problem is that there are just so many distractions, right? There's every kid now has a phone at a young age, right? And that has notifications going off and all their friends have it and, and there's you know, uh, just content online, always their attention span doesn't need to be long because there's just so many new fresh ideas and, and things to be doing all the time. So as a parent, and I have three very, very young children, and we, we try very hard to, to limit the amount of time that they spend on a screen. Um, it's not always easy. Um, but I, you definitely notice the difference when you remove the screens from their lives for a day or two, um, and, and encourage them to go outside, to do things with their hands, to, to be bored, right? Um, it, it's, it's sometimes not nice to say like, hey, be bored, right? But I find like that's where, where children thrive. They, they use their imagination, they focus on tasks, uh, they're better at that. So, you know, it's, it's easy to say this, but I would limit the amount of uh, access they have to um, digital content just because it's so easy and it doesn't require them to think right um and in terms of increasing the attention span you know just trying to to to, to do more like that requires them to be present you know um again it's it's tough i don't know everybody's schedule and stuff and and if you can even spend that much time with your kids but the more that you can doing things with them um i find that they they learn to value the moment better and that can um, help with their attention span. Okay. Um, I don't, I think we can maybe wrap up there. Um, Nikita, if you're there, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Yes. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you so much. Uh, you can look at the comments, everyone saying great session, very interesting tricks. Um, so yeah. We'll uh, we'll see you again probably in the next year. Great. Thank best. you so much. And thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays, Nelson, from all of us at Upgrad. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.